Every child goes through several stages of development. To understand the child better, the adult, be it the parent or professional, should know the characteristics of development stages. What should we know about the child's first year of life? The child is totally dependent on the person taking care of them. The child develops feelings of attachment towards the parent care provider, which ensures an emotional, protective relationship towards them. The child recognizes close persons in the family and reacts to strangers. The child learns emotions by imitating the parents or other close persons. Communicates needs through movements, facial expression, crying. The child gets to know their environment by discovering various objects, knows the ones which make noise, the ones which move, the ones they like, the ones not to be touched. Physically, when the child turns one, they develop elements of walking, crawling, assisted walking, and finally, independent walking. What are the characteristics for the stage between one and three years of age or early childhood? The child's movement is much more independent. At the same time, they remain dependent on the parent providing support and protection. The child is very curious and impatient to learn how each object works and is very active. They have a rich imagination and can create unusual characters and events. The egocentrism is specific for this age. More and more, the child understands their uniqueness. At the same time, the primary negativism appears, when the child resists by crying, screaming. The child does not really cooperate with other children, but wishes to communicate. They ask the parents, care providers, to play with them. The child is sensitive. Sudden swings from laughter to crying can occur, for no apparent reason. The mood depends on meeting their needs. child like at the age of three to six, seven years old? The child is more autonomous, feeds themselves, dresses and removes clothes, chooses toys to play with, etc. The main activity is playing. It's through play the child explores, learns and develops the ability to relate to others. The magical thinking is specific to this age. Everything surrounding the child is animated. Being curious, the child asks many questions. They can recount past, present and future events, but with no specification of time or date. At the same time, many of the events may be invented. Important, the child can tell about the place of an event by associating it with an event in their life. The child learns the basic skills of reading and writing. The four- to five-year-old child's attention span can be around 20 to 25 minutes, and that of a six- to seven-year-old can be 25 to 40 minutes. The child becomes more confident, develops independent and controlled behavior, and starts to understand the opinions of others. happening with the child between 6 and 11 years old? The main activity is learning. Playing still has an important place, but it is gradually replaced by learning. The young school-age child gradually shifts from concrete thinking to logical thinking. The ability to understand the cause-effect relationship develops as well as the perception of time and space. 
the child can focus for 30 to 45 minutes. That's why recreation breaks are absolutely necessary. The child's responsibility for their action increases. Hence, the parent's control decreases. In this context, the sense of duty appears of affiliation with the school or class. From an emotional point of view, the child goes through intense emotions and feelings, but doesn't yet have the ability to control them. They are attracted to forbidden and unknown things. The child understands everything happening in the family, conflicts, fights, breakups, and can explain certain things, as well as express an opinion and take a stand in a situation. What is specific for the preteen age? The child manifests a strong tendency of independence, in parallel with the need of protection and affection from adults. The child's inner life develops, initiative and goal establishment appear. Sexual maturation creates tense emotions, confusion and discomfort for the child. The child keeps searching for their self. This is the age of searches. The search process is often unorganized. For example, they get dressed while walking, shout, joyfully recount, gesticulate, laugh out loud. You can hardly control them. The best path is over the fence, ditch, where they have to make brisk, more energetic moves, where more activity is required. The child experiences a wide range of feelings, such as restlessness, anxiety, irritability, uncertainty, insecurity, joy, enthusiasm and happiness. Sudden mood swings occur. Relationships with the opposite sex intensify. The child has a tendency towards self-affirmation in the peer group. Their opinion counts more than the parents. The relationship with parents becomes tense. The child is rebellious, opposing, generates conflicts and uses vulgar or offensive language. What does the teenage mean? Teenage is the final stage of childhood manifested through getting out from under the parents and school control and integration into the social life. Here we have passion, romance, spontaneity. The child is a nonconformist, actively fights to fulfill their wishes, confronts and opposes the adult world. They create their own value system regarding justice, equality, dignity. The child's view of the world and life forms. Self-awareness appears. The child realizes who they are and what they are like, what they represent for others and for themselves, what their goals and their ideals are, what they want to become. The fluctuation of emotions can be observed, mood swings. Knowing the age characteristics allows us to better understand the child, understand the child's emotions and behavior, build a positive relationship with the child. This way we ensure good growth and development, a good training for adult life. Knowing the child opens doors to their world. Protect your children.
The child is like a vessel which needs to be carefully filled during their entire development. Their needs must be met in order for them to have smooth development. Regardless of where they live and the cultural environment they belong to, the children's needs are universal. We will arrange the child's needs in a pyramid. The basis of the pyramid are the fundamental needs, the physiological ones, such as the need for shelter, food, water, sleep, hygiene, and care. Not meeting these needs directly reflects on the child's health. A child with weak health is a fragile and vulnerable child. The second level is safety, specifically security, protection, a stable environment, and boundaries. The parents, care providers, have an obligation to protect the child from risk factors and ensure, both psychologically and physically, a balanced, safe and comfortable environment. Here we also include the need of setting boundaries. As the child grows, they need guidance to direct them on a safe path. The social needs follow. The child must have a strong and stable family, based on harmony, understanding, and patience. Children need love and affection from the persons closest to them, especially parents. The child has to see they are wanted and loved in order to learn to love those around them and themselves. And, if in the first years of life, the social needs are centered around parents, care providers, once the child grows, they need friends and to integrate in a group other than the family. The fourth level is esteem and respect. The child needs encouragement, motivation and appreciation in order to get better results. They need confirmation that what they are doing is good. The child needs proof they are important to the parents' care providers, attention, gestures and verbal messages. The child needs to be accepted by their parents in spite of some inabilities, limitations or defects. Only this way the child will learn how to live with these inabilities. Otherwise, they will develop feelings of shame, fear or guilt for who they are. To earn independence and recognition from those around them, the child needs responsibilities and respect for their name. The last level covers the need of personal fulfillment. In this regard, the child needs new experiences, knowledge and discoveries through which they achieve accomplishments. The child establishes certain goals to reach and plots new personal prospects, thus building their personal destiny. Important to remember, satisfying the needs on one level will naturally lead to the needs above, thus ensuring the child's complete development. <laughs> When one of the child's needs is not met, it leads to an emotional and behavioral imbalance. Thus, behind any repeated, unwanted or inadequate behavior for extended periods, there are many unmet needs. The adult's task is to understand why the child behaves a certain way and to look for ways to meet their needs. For example, let's take the case of a teenager who is aggressive towards others, skips class, begs, drinks. Usually, we, the adults, react negatively to such children. Let's try to look at this child from a different perspective.
What are the feelings of a child behaving this way? If we put the inadequate behavior aside, we will find this child feeling dissatisfaction with themselves, suffering, shame, confusion, frustration, vexation, disappointment, anger. Most of the time, negative emotions prevail over the positive ones and are mainly the result of unsatisfied needs. What could these unsatisfied needs be? The child may feel the lack of parental love, may have an unstable family, and their physiological needs may not be fully met. Probably the child does not feel respect and esteem from those around them. They're not encouraged or offered incentives, do not feel important to parents or care providers. Besides these, they may be labeled by peers. When we're talking about a child with deviant behavior, the setting becomes more complicated. Not having developed skills of coping with emotions, especially negative ones resulting from unsatisfied needs, the child reaches an apex of tension, which in turn triggers an impulse to act in order to release the tension. The child searches for a behavior to satisfy the need and acts, shouts aggressively, hits, steals, beats others. As a result, the tension drops and they satisfy, in an inappropriate manner, either the need for attention or protection, physiological needs or others. Subsequently, all child's behaviors send the adult a message about the child's satisfied or unsatisfied needs. The child's needs are interdependent. None of them can exist without the others. A child without emotional safety, stability, coming from a family with frequent conflicts where the parents do not know or cannot meet the child's needs, may have difficulties relating, building stable, healthy relationships, starting a family. And this marks development as a person, an achievement of personal fulfillment. The child having quality time with parents, care providers, their attention and availability, encouragement and appreciation, will learn they are important, valuable and special, and has things to offer others. They will know they deserve respect and recognition. Only this way will they manage to feel fulfilled to find their place and role in this world later in life. Make time to recognize the child's needs. Protect the children. Which are the children who end up under the domain of the justice system? What are the signs to help us identify and help them? It is important for parents or care providers and professionals to recognize at-risk children and intervene in a timely manner to protect their rights and best interests. Because they cannot care for themselves and thus depend on us, the adults, children are considered vulnerable. What leads to an increased vulnerability for a child, putting them at risk? From a domestic perspective, children may be considered more vulnerable if they come from violent, exploitive families, divorced families, families with a step-parent, underprotective or overprotective families, a low living standard, a minimal level of schooling, and alcohol abuse are risk factors increasing a child's vulnerability. 
Among social sources making a child vulnerable are stigmatization and discrimination, marginalization, social exclusion. There are also individual factors which increase the vulnerability, such as developmental crises, a child's difficult temper, behavior problems, physical or intellectual disabilities, learning or adaptation difficulties, low self-esteem, lack of self-confidence, emotional sensitivity. The child can be vulnerable in different ways and in different situations. Sometimes the child can become a victim or commit certain antisocial actions. Who is the victim child? A victim child is the child who incurred moral, physical or material damage by action or inaction. The victim child can be identified through physical, psychological and behavioral signs. The physical signs tell us about physical or sexual abuse. The body can reveal fractures, burns, cuts, hematomas, bruising, bite marks, scratches, lesions of the genitals. The child may report frequent headaches. On the emotional level, the victim child can show deep sadness. Even depression feels guilty without reason, has a strong sense of insecurity. Some children become irritable and sensitive to external stimuli. Others have a strong desire for revenge. The victim child has an unstable behavior, becomes aggressive towards those around them. They are impulsive and violent, attempt suicide, may try drugs or alcohol. Some isolate themselves. Others rebel and are in conflict with those around them. Some skip school. Others run away from home, living on the streets. In this context, a child, victim of a form of violence, neglect, exploitation or trafficking, may be identified by observing and analyzing the changes in this behavior towards others, compared to how they formerly behaved. Another aspect is that the presence of just one sign does not necessarily mean the child is a victim. When signs show up repeatedly or combined, they should signal the adults, be it parents or professionals, to pay more attention to the case and consider the possibility of violence, neglect, exploitation or trafficking. Who is the witness child? A child who saw an illegal action or has information about one can be a witness. The child may become a witness when one or both parents are violent in the family, when the divorce is violent, when accidentally or forcedly observes aggression among peers, or is obliged to take part. The child becomes a witness when they observe aggressive, violent acts in school or the social environment, crimes committed by strangers, even when they are manipulated to participate in antisocial actions. The witness child lives in fear 
of their declarations, triggering the revenge of the interested parties and with a deep feeling of guilt. The child has an intense discomfort which can manifest itself through depression, frustration, tension, despair and difficulties focusing at school. The child is aware of what is happening, confused at the same time and distrustful to denounce. This is supported by a low self-esteem and underappreciation of self-worth. Who is the child in conflict with the law? The child who comes to commit illegal actions is a child who does not obey legal, social and moral rules and norms, has no interest in family, school demands and obligations, tends to be friends with deviant peers. A child with destructive tendencies, no ability to form relationships based on affection and respect, and peacefully solve conflicts. A child who previously manifested antisocial behavior, as well as no ability to learn from negative experiences. A child who learned from their family or social environment to solve problems through aggressive or violent means. A child attracted by risk behaviors, smoking, alcohol, drugs, and self-aggressive behaviors, tattoos, cuts, cigarette burns, suicide attempts. Perhaps a child who experienced a traumatic episode suffered abuse, stereotyping, or discrimination. As a personality, a child with low tolerance to frustration, low self-control, and lack of guilt. The child has a false image about autonomy and individual freedom, a distorted perception of the meaning of life and interpersonal relationships. Thus, through their behavior, the child in conflict with the law expresses contempt for social activities, work, family, school, and society. Important to remember, a child whose needs are not met is a vulnerable child. A vulnerable child is at risk of becoming a victim child or directly a child in conflict with the law. A victim child in an unfavorable environment and without adult protection may become a child in conflict with the law. A child is not born a criminal, but the deviant behavior can be a consequence of the adult's response to the child's developmental needs. In order to satisfy the child's needs and respect their rights, whether they are a victim, a witness, or in conflict with the law, it is necessary to consider the child's risk of victimization, the child's risk of committing illegal acts. The more risk factors are present, and the higher the child's vulnerability, the greater the risk. And if the risk factors and the child's vulnerabilities are minimal, there is no risk of victimization accordingly. Make time to be responsive and react promptly. Protect the children. Torture and inhuman or degrading treatment is absolutely prohibited and cannot be justified or tolerated under any circumstances, neither towards adults nor children. On December 10, 1984, the United Nations adopted the Convention Against Torture and Other Cruel, Inhuman or Degrading Treatment or Punishment. According to this convention, 
Torture is any act by which severe pain or suffering, whether physical or mental, is intentionally inflicted on a person for such purposes as obtaining from them, or a third person, information or a confession, punishing them for an act they or a third person committed or is suspected of having committed, intimidating or coercing them or a third person, or for any reason based on discrimination of any kind when such pain or suffering is inflicted by or at the instigation of or with the consent or acquiescence of a public official or other person acting in an official capacity. The specialists classify torture as physical torture, psychological or white torture, and sexual torture. Any form of torture can have physical, mental, and social consequences for the victim. Children feel the consequences of torture more acutely. According to the existing classifications jointly developed by medical doctors and lawyers, the consequences of torture can be physical, psychological, and social. Physical consequences which may be identified bruising, hematomas, superficial and deep tissue or limb injuries, craniocerebral trauma, spinal cord trauma, post-traumatic cotitis and impaired hearing and severe prognosis, fractures, facial disfigurement, genital injuries, sexually transmitted diseases, contusions of internal organs, especially kidneys. Torture has severe psychological consequences as well. Mainly, the victims exhibit post-traumatic stress disorder, dominant anxiety and depressive states, among other symptoms such as disturbing memories of the traumatic events, sleep disorders, frequent insomnia, nightmares about their arrest and detention especially in the acute period or immediately after the ill treatment. The increased nervousness persists long after the trauma and often leads to deteriorating relationships with others, including with family members. It leads to a complicated living environment for the victim and their entourage. Social consequences of torture involve affected educational process, difficulties in social and professional integration after release, increased risk of social exclusion, social labeling and discrimination, deterioration of social relations including with loved ones. All these consequences intensify social isolation of this category of children and increase the risk of delinquent behavior or affiliation with criminal groups because they feel rejected by the rest of society. Protection against torture is an absolute human right which does not admit derogations by the state in any form, neither on grounds of public emergency, state security, combating terrorism, or any other reason. Children coming in contact with the criminal justice system enjoy a set of rights and guarantees against torture, which the specialists in the field are obliged to know, and the parents or legal guardians of the children should know. A child's detention or arrest are applied only as exceptional measures and only in cases stipulated by law. If a child is detained or arrested, the parents or legal guardians must be notified immediately. Children in detention or under arrest must be detained separately from adults and already incarcerated children. 
Within one hour after the minor's detention, the prosecuting authority must request from the Territorial Office of the National Council for state-guaranteed legal aid or other parties acting on its behalf, a public defender which would provide free and state-guaranteed emergency legal aid. The detainee is immediately informed about the grounds for detention. The minor suspect accused has the right to confidential meetings with a defender without their number or duration being limited. The minor's interrogation is to take place only in the presence of a chosen defender or lawyer. The minor's interrogation cannot take longer than two hours without recess, and it cannot exceed four hours per day with mandatory participation of the defender, teacher or psychologist. From the moment of arrest or arrival at the detention facility, all minor detainees must be seen by a doctor or medical assistant without delay and preferably in conditions of privacy. Considering the gender characteristics, boys and girls will be treated differently. In cases of children in conflict with the law, detention or arrest should be considered the last resort Still, if a child has been detained, they must be informed of their accusations directly and as soon as possible. Or, if it is the case, through their parents or legal guardian. The child should have legal, medical, or any other appropriate assistance for the preparation and presentation of the defense. The child victims of torture have the right to file complaints in both national and supranational courts. The European Court of Human Rights, for example. Specialists working with children must remember that minors in conflict with the law are exposed to an increased risk of abuse and ill treatment, and the authorities have a special obligation to protect these children from violence. The specialist must report and solve cases of child torture and ill treatment to ensure child-friendly judicial proceedings according to international standards. Protect the children. A child can, at a certain point, become the subject of a media story. In such situations, there are a set of rules which have to be followed by specialists working with children. In order to protect the child, the parents or legal guardians should also know these rules. When media representatives are looking for some information, or the specialists and the institution itself consider the case should be made public, they should take these three aspects into account. The first important aspect is the public interest, or, in other words, the objective interest of the population to know what happened in a specific case. The second very important aspect, but which complicates the specialist speech, is the rights of individuals involved. We are specifically talking here about the right to privacy and the presumption of innocence. These rights are valid for both adults and children. Moreover, when children are involved, we protect these rights even more because we think from the perspective of applying the principle of the child's best interest. And thirdly, the specialists take into account the obligations and interests of the institutions they represent. When we talk about public interest, we mean an objective, justified interest of the population to know about important phenomena in the society, and not just simple curiosity for the sensational, for private, macabre details, etc.
If, for example, a 10 or 12 year old child has murdered someone, then it is important to bring the case to public attention, but not the name of the child or other personal data or pictures from the crime scene. It is important to specialist or the institution make an analysis and correctly weigh the type of information the public has a right to know and the details which just satisfy the curiosity of the public. When we are talking about the rights of individuals involved, specifically the right to private and family life and the right to protection of personal data, and we're talking about children either being victims or suspected of crimes or even convicted minors, the media is obliged to protect them, to not disclose their name, address, parents, school, or municipality. This way, it gives them a better chance for rehabilitation if they are victims, and for correction and social reintegration if they are children who committed crimes. When approached by the media, the specialist will talk about the deed and the events, but will not give details to allow the children involved in a specific case to be identified. When we talk about the presumption of innocence, we mean the legal provision according to which any individual accused of a crime is presumed innocent until legally proven guilty in a public trial in which all guarantees for defense have been ensured. So, only at the end of the trial will we know if the individual is indeed guilty. For this reason, the specialists must use the terms defining the legal status of the prosecuted individual correctly. Suspect, accused, culprit, and must treat the suspected individual from a neutral position and avoid information from the perspective of the accuser. The presumption of innocence is one of the reasons we must protect the identity of the suspects of crimes, particularly when they are minors, because herein lies the child's best interest. There were also some exceptions to the rule. The full identity of a minor suspect can be disclosed if the public interest for knowing who that person is outweighs the private right to protection. For example, if there is a very dangerous, wanted young person with aggressive behavior and, by being at large, they pose a potential threat for the people of the country or the region. In addition to the above, the specialists must keep in mind they also represent an institution having obligations to the population and is usually financed from the public budget. The institution, by default, must respond to the needs of the population to observe the laws and people's rights. Among the expectations of the population from a public institution are transparency, respectful and open specialists, including in their contact with the media. The specialists should not avoid the media or in any other ways reject it. On the contrary, the specialists should see in the media an opportunity to inform the public on issues of public interest. For example, if a specialist says, no comment, it will be a disservice to their institution. These words show incompetence or insecurity. Accordingly, for the public this will be a clue that the institution or the specialist is conspiring to withhold important information. An institution represented this way will lose its credibility. 
In conclusion, a few recommendations for the specialists approached by media. Respond to information requests from the media, but only provide information of public interest. Respect the rights of individuals involved and protect the child's image and private data. Provide clear, concise answers, leaving no room for interpretation. Do not feel obligated to answer just any random question merely because it was asked. For issues of public interest, prepare a press release in advance. Protect the children. Have you ever imagined life without communication? Without words, gestures, voice, and emotional expressions? Communication is inevitable, and it is used as a tool to respond to the need of expressing something to someone, being heard and understood. Communication means more than a message and an answer. Our thoughts and beliefs, Emotions and feelings, needs and wishes are expressed through words. Still, just 7% of our message is transmitted verbally. The tone of voice, volume, speech rate and intensity, pauses and highlights are the pair of verbal language and make for 38% of the message. The other 55% go to nonverbal language, which includes all of the different gestures people use to accompany or sometimes even replace their words. The nonverbal aspects to consider in our communication with children are mimic, visual contact, body posture, gestures, physical contact, distance. Perceiving only one language by ignoring the others increases the risk of misunderstanding the speaker's message. The most common blockers inhibiting and decreasing the efficiency of communication with children are threats, labeling, criticism, irony, blaming, reproaches, humiliation, and indifference. These come from attitudes, stereotypes, and prejudice towards the children, especially those at risk. Consequently, the child's reciprocity and trust in adults will decrease, and the child's mistrust creates obstacles for the specialists working with them and their families. In their relationship with children, both parents and specialists must be able to communicate and understand the message. Considering the speaker's personality, the situation, place, and time of discussion, sometimes, in order to understand what the child says, we need more questions and rephrasing, as well as the ability to listen and hear the speaker. Active listening is the main skill for efficient communication. To really listen means to empathize with the other person's thoughts and feelings. Active listening includes the whole body, not just the mouth and ears, but also the eyes, gestures, and especially the heart. To better understand the communication with children, we will use five key verbs. To be, to feel to see, to speak, 
and to listen. To be present and open in your communication with children means to find a quiet place where the child feels at ease to talk. Sit beside the child and down with him, not behind him. Use expressions and gestures to encourage the child to tell you more and which will show you understand. Try to pay attention only to the child, without distractions. Show interest for what the child is going through. Be respectful. Any child, regardless of the situation they are in, will cooperate if they feel understood. For that, be lenient and give the child time to tell their story. Be trustworthy and show them you can be trusted to keep a secret. Show affection. Accept the child without judging them. Have the courage to tolerate their behavior, even if it seems disgusting. Each person has both positive and negative characteristics. Some children are in difficult situations due to circumstances for which they cannot be held accountable. This is why you need to emphasize the child's positive traits. To show a child they have your undivided attention, try to look them in the eyes or in the face, but do not exaggerate. Observe the child's posture. Notice their facial expression. Try to understand what hasn't been said. Discover the true emotions and feelings behind the story and nonverbal language. If the child feels pressured, tired, give them some time. To speak is to express your thoughts and emotions into words and behaviors, which in turn should be clear so the child understands what you're saying. Better to keep the messages simple, concrete, and specific, not complex, abstract, or general. Ask a question, then wait for an answer. Do not ask many questions at the same time, as the child becomes confused and doesn't know what to answer. The child needs to feel that the adult listens to him. Therefore, listen carefully and try to remember what the child tells you. Rephrase what was said to you to show you understood correctly the message. Ask questions to clarify details or to understand better. React and offer encouraging suggestions and answers. It is important to remember Children must feel the adults care about them and what they are saying. Their words and their stories must be treated seriously and with respect. Protect the children. For an efficient intervention when working with children, the specialists need to follow the case evaluation methodology. There are several evaluation methods, such as observation, documenting, interview, questionnaires, etc. Further on, we will discuss the interview technique in working with children. The interview is a dynamic interactive conversation with a specific goal between a specialist and the interviewee. Unlike interrogation, the finality of which is to obtain testimonies or evidence, the goal of an interview is to obtain exact and relevant information and collect reliable data to be further used in making a decision and planning further actions. 
The interview technique follows several stages. One, interview preparation and planning. Two, the inception of the interview, making contact and introductions. Three, conducting the interview to understand, clarify, and consult the child or family. Four, concluding the interview with conclusions and proposed assistance. All specialists from the multidisciplinary team use the interview and they should follow its stages. Even if the goal of this technique is common, each specialist will follow their objectives in an interview due to specifics of the assistance provided. An interview conducted by the child protection specialists will start by establishing the goal and subjects to be discussed. It is important to know in advance how to approach the issues and which difficulties may come up. The specialist should know if other specialists from the multidisciplinary team will also participate in the interview and what will be the role of each of them. The place and setting of the interview should be known to the specialist in advance. The goal of the second stage is to make contact with the child and introduce the specialist. It is important the child knows your name, who you are, your role, and the goal of the discussion. Explain to the child why you gather information, who will use it, and how. Explain that the meeting is confidential, but it may be needed to share the information with other specialists. Use a simple and understandable language. Be open and friendly to help the child feel at ease. If at a certain point what the child said is unclear, you should ask them to repeat or rephrase what they said. The third stage of the interview is meant to clarify the necessary information and collect data. In order to achieve the objective of this stage and encourage the child to talk, you should follow the recommendations below. Give the child enough time to express their thoughts. It will help them feel at ease. It would be helpful to reserve time for a discussion on neutral subjects, such as school, games, before approaching more personal and painful subjects. Consider the child's age characteristics and respect the limits of their attention span. A series of shorter meetings could be more useful than long meetings. Convey the message enforcing that the child is accepted regardless of what they may have done. Listen to the child carefully and show respect for their personality and feelings. Express empathy with messages such as, this probably really upset you, or I see you're afraid. Let the child say everything they have to say without interrupting them. When you feel the need, take breaks. Give the child a chance to ask questions, to say something and make a summary of what was discussed or decided. It will help them feel they were taken seriously. End the meeting with a positive element, especially if the child opened up about traumatic events. Avoid promising the child unrealistic things, such as, your mother will surely come back home, or, your father will never hit you again. If you have no answer, it is correct to say, I am not sure, or, I will try to find them, but I don't know where your parents are now, or, I don't know if your brother will return. This way, the unrealistic, harmful expectations of the child will be avoided. Inform the child about what will happen further and provide your contact details. 
One of the fundamental abilities of a child protection specialist ensuring the success of an interview is wording the questions. There are several types of questions. Open questions are those starting with what, who, how long, where, how, which, when, and determine broad answers providing a lot of information. Closed questions are those giving limited possible answers, such as yes or no. These questions require precise answers relevant to evaluating the issue. Still, used frequently, the conversation tends to look like an interrogation and communication can be hindered. Try to use more open questions. They encourage the child to explain things in their own way. Avoid using the question, why? Because the child may feel judged and forced to explain. Avoid multiple questions. For a child, it is already too complicated to remember the first question when you finish asking the last one. Ask the questions one by one, giving the child time to think before answering. Avoid questions with suggested answers. The child will feel obliged to give the expected answer. These questions manipulate or give the feeling of having no choice. Remember, you must explore the subjects. An efficient interview looks more like a discussion. Here are some examples of questions often worded wrong and the recommended version. Instead of, did you get upset? Use, how did you feel when it happened? Instead of, why did you hit? Use, what made you hit? Instead of, where did you find the wallet? Who was around? Do your parents know about it? Did you tell anyone? Use, where did you find the wallet? Who was around? Who did you tell about the wallet you found? Instead of, your father is the one beating you every night, isn't he? Use, who used to beat you? Finally, some important recommendations which ensure efficiency of the interview. Choose a space where the child feels comfortable. Use child-friendly spaces in the municipality, community centers for children, or psychology offices in the education institutions. If the interview will take place at school, except for cases when the abuser is school staff, then talk to the school management and ensure the child's privacy. Children have to be called in from classes as discreetly as possible, and the school staff will respect the confidentiality. Home interviews may be appropriate when parents are protective and the offender is not part of the family. Try to avoid taking notes during the interview. If it is necessary, explain why and ask a child's permission beforehand. If a child is crying, do not stop the conversation immediately. Try to find out what made them cry. Tell the child they must recount only the things which happened, even some of their secrets. Let the child know if you repeat certain questions. It does not mean that they gave the wrong answer, but it is you who did not understand well and need clarification. Tell the child they can tell you without embarrassment if they need a break, water, or to use the toilet. Important to remember, the success of the interview is ensured by how competent the specialist is in efficiently relating to the child, regardless of their age or status. Respect, empathy, privacy, confidentiality are some of the principles of a successful interview. Appropriate question wording ensures obtaining more information. Protect the children. Thank you.